Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Euzubillahimineşşeytanirracim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Allahümme akhrijni minel zulümatil vahme ve akrimini bi nuril fahme. Allahümme aftah aleyna abva bi rahmetike. Ve anşur aleyna kazayini ulumike bi rahmetike ya arhman rahimin. Evet, sari. Zabırdast dua ehem. İlm ki husul ke liye. Jö ajkal hem logun ke yad nehi. کیونکہ علم کی کوئی طلب باقی نہیں رہی ہے آج کا لیکچر میں دو پارٹس ہیں ان دی فرسٹ پارٹ آئی ویل ایکسپلین دی بیسک بیزین تھیوری ان کیلکولیشن ان دی سمپلسٹ پاسبل فارمیٹ سو بیسکلی یو ہیو ٹو رینڈم ایونٹس ون رینڈم ایونٹ اوکرز اٹ ہیز ٹو پاسبل آؤٹ کمز ای ون ان ای ٹو So you can think of this actually as a situation where according to a random outcome the world will change. It will go on one track or it will go on the other track. Like uh, the Battle of Waterloo. If Napoleon wins then the world will be come, fall under domination of France and if uh, England wins then the world will fall under the domination of England. So. There is a probability of these two events and one of these two events will take place and then um, the world will be different. But now there is a second random event which will take place after the first one has and the second random event will be, will have different probabilities according to which state of the world you are in. So. Uh, if you talk about the conditional probability of the second event given the first, it's uh, completely clear and well defined and easy to understand that uh, depending on the outcome of the first event, the probability of the second event can be different. If the French win, then the probability of a person speaking French is going to be high, randomly chosen. If uh, the English win, then the probability of a person speaking French will be low. So the conditional probability is different in the different states of the world. So that is fine. Now what the Bayesian calculation does is it reverses this. It says that what is the probability that Napoleon won at Waterloo given that a one person that we meet is speaking French. So this is actually the reverse conditional probability. So now the question is, okay, does this make sense? I and mean, this is why this whole thing is very controversial. That's why Bayesian is not, you know, nobody is teaching it in Pakistan. And there's a lot of controversy about the topic, mainly because uh, somehow if you think of the time sequence, then this doesn't make sense that, uh, you see, we are talking about, uh, we are talking about taking an event which occurred uh, later. And then we say, okay, conditional on the outcome of this event, what is the probability of the first event? But the, when the first, uh, when the second event occurred, the first event had already happened, so uh, there is no probability. Okay, so uh, there is some difficulty in understanding, interpreting. There are various ways to do that, and uh, we will discuss that. But the point is that there is a controversy involved here. All right. So first, we start with some technical uh, definitions. So B1 is called a Bernoulli trial if it has two possible outcomes and uh, we code these outcomes as 1 and 0 and in um, order to be able to talk about it we use the term success for 1 and failure for 0. This is just in order to be able to talk about it in language instead of talking about 1s and zeros, we talk about success and failure. It doesn't really have any meaning other than that. So now the probability of success is P and the probability of failure is 1 minus P and sometimes you use the notation Q. This is so standard that uh, P and Q are commonly used in this context. Now the one thing that is not emphasized in conventional treatments is the timing. Timing is all important and timing is never mentioned in uh, conventional treatment. So that's why it becomes very confusing and hard to understand. 
the there is a world which is uh, the pre-trial, which is also called pre-experimental, and then there is the post-experimental world. These two worlds are completely different. Probability exists in the pre-experimental world when the trial has not taken place and anything can happen. After the trial has taken place, then one of the two things has come true and now there is no probability. Probability is finished. So now at that point, you have you, this is called the post-experimental world. And these two worlds are very different and basically all of statistics and also all of probability is about matching the post-experimental world and the pre-experimental world. In probability theory, what we do is we say, I know the prob uh, the, what the pre-experimental world looks like, so tell me what the post-experimental world looks like. In statistics, we do the opposite problem. We look at the post-experimental world and we ask, what is the pre-experimental world look like? So this is the, that's basically the two subjects. All right, so now what we're going to do is to look at a sequence of two Bernoulli trials. So the first trial takes place and there are two possible outcomes. One of them is success and one of them is failure. So the probability is P1 and Q1. And uh, so you have these two branches. The first branch shows the uh, B1 equals 1 and the second branch shows B1 equals 0. After that, we have the second trial. Uh, the second trial can also have its success and failure. So there are a total of four uh, branches, uh, success and success, success followed by failure, failure followed by success, and failure followed by failure. So now um, some basic probability calculations are that, um, are that, um, you see, uh, basically probability is the same as percentage. So, for example, after the first trial, suppose that there's a 25% success probability and 75%. So there are 25 cases on the success side and 75 cases on the failure side. Then you go down further and suppose that the second trial probability of the B2 success and failure is 50% and 50%. Then of those 25, 12 and a half will come in the first circle and 12 and a half will come in the other circle. So basically, the probability is calculated by multiplying. You take 50% and multiply it by the 25%. It's half of whatever was available to you in that circle. Now on the other branch, the probabilities can be different because we have a, a different case has a, happened. So now suppose that uh, in the other branch, after... Um, B1 is 0, then B2 can be, uh, the success probability is 75%. Uh, so then uh, uh, the failure probability was 75% and then the pro success probability of, P3, of B2 is 75, so the total probability will 7, 0.75 times 0.75 and that will be the probability of uh, success followed by failure, failure followed by success, sorry. And then two failures will be uh, 75 by 20 times 25. So it's very simple. It's very easy. There are two rules of probability. One is the multiplicative rule and it says that if you want to calculate, I think I have it written down here. Yes. If you want to calculate the probability of E and F, two events, you can do it by multiplying. First find out the probability of F independently. That's called the marginal probability, very important term in Bayesian calculations. And then there is the conditional probability of E given F. So first you find out when E happens because you want to find out the probability of both of the things together. So if one of them doesn't occur then there's no chance. I mean so you have to have probability of both of them separately. So take either one. This is the interesting thing about the uh, Bayesian. You can, you can take either one event to condition on. Uh, so we condition on F for example. So we say okay what's the probability of F? We calculate that then we say, okay, given that F has happened, what is the probability of E given F? And we calculate that and then we multiply the two and you have the joint probability. So this is a very important problem. It says the joint probability of two events is equal to the conditional probability of E given F times the marginal probability of F. So there are three different probabilities, the joint, the conditional and the marginal. So uh, in the case that we were just discussing, 
if I, any one of the four circles at the bottom, these are the four possible outcomes, you can calculate the probability by this method. For example, the B1 equals 1, first success, and then second failure is equal to the probability first of success, B1 equals 1, times the probability of second failure followed uh, given that the first trial was successful. So this is just fine. This is a legitimate formula. B2 happens after B1, so the conditioning is proper. Now the thing is that the other formula also makes perfect mathematical sense and there is no difficulty in uh, writing the mathematics of it. So you can say that, okay, instead of conditioning on B1, which is the one that happened first, I can condition B2. So we can say that, okay, it's probability B2 equals 0 times the probability that B1 equals 1 given that B2 equals 0. In some sense, this is an illegitimate formula because you cannot condition B1 on B2 because B1 happens before, uh, B2 happens before B1. Oh, sorry, B1 happens before B2. But mathematics doesn't know the difference, so you can do it. So let me show you. So once, from this formula, we can calculate the conditional probability, the reverse conditional probability. So I'll show it uh, in a more dramatic example. So we have this uh, situation where the Battle of Waterloo takes place. The probability of a French win or Napoleon wins is uh, one fourth. Uh, the other uh, was Duke of Wellington on the English side. He was commanding the uh, British forces. So let's suppose that his probability of winning is three fourths. He actually won. It's not clear that these probabilities are right. But some people say it was very close. But anyway, this is just for the sake of calculation. So suppose that one of these victories happens and 100 years later we, we are living in this world and we randomly take a person who is living in the planet and we ask him to speak French. So does he speak French or not? So the thing is that uh, if the Napoleon won, then likely the French would have established an empire and a lot of people would have been speaking French. And in the event of loss, this would not be true. So I'm making up these probabilities here. Suppose that randomly chosen person speaks French, the probability is yes, after a Napoleon victory is 40%. And the probability that doesn't speak French is 60%. Even, you know, if you have global domination, 40% is a pretty big number. So, uh, on the other hand, <coughs> if uh, the French lose, uh, then you have, so, so NF and then N no F, and then you have, uh, if the French lose, then the probability of French speaker is only 10%. And the probability of not a French speaker is 90%. So this is fairly simple, straightforward setup. Now, so we have four events, NF, N and no French, W, Wellington and French, and Wellington and no French. And now we can calculate all of the four probabilities. The first probability is uh, 0 0.4, 40% times 25%, which comes out to 10%. The second probability is 60% times 25%, uh, which is 15%. And then the, on the other side of the branch, we have 75% times 10%, it's 0 0.75, which is 7.5%. And on the other side, we have 90% times 75, which is 67.5%. So basically, both sides, on, on, on one side you have 25%, it's split up into 10% and 15%. On the other side, you have 75%, and that's split up into 67.5 and 7.5. And, and this is the way it always is, Yani. All of the yani, branches below must sum to the branch above. Okay, so now probability of that somebody is speaking French given that Napoleon won or Napoleon lost, it makes perfect sense. It's the logical sequence. But probability that uh, Napoleon won given that the person I have is speaking French doesn't make a lot of sense because uh, now, if I'm in this living in this world where I'm looking at people, one of these two events, I'm living only in one of those two worlds. I'm, I'm not living in both of those worlds. I'm living in a world where Napoleon has won or I'm living in a world where Napoleon has lost. So what happened on the other branch, I have no idea. It's not there. So to ask, um, and, and probably uh, the... So basically, um, uh, we can make the calculation. Let's, let's first make the calculation, then look at the philosophy. So what's the probability of 
Uh, the joint probability that n equals 1, f equals 1, we just calculated it's 10%. What's the probability of, uh, what's the marginal probability of a French speaker? Now, this is, this is one of the keys. Now, how do you get the marginal probability? Well, you have to look at all possible cases where you have the French speaker. So, part of the marginal probability is the 10% on the French win side, but the other part is the 7.5% on the other side. This is the total probability of French speaking. If we look at the pre-experimental situation, suppose we are living in the world before the Battle of Waterloo, and we ask what is the probability that a hundred years from now, a randomly chosen person will be speaking French, then this is the correct calculation because you have to sum up both of the branches. You have to go through the possibility of French win, in which case you will get 10%, and the probability of English win, in which you get 7.5%, add them up and you get the 17.5 percent. Uh, now, so I have the joint probability is 10 percent and the marginal probability is 17.5, so I can now calculate the conditional probability from this formula. It's 10 percent divided by 17.5 percent, which is 57 percent. So I have, this is the, this is the heart, this is the Bayes formula, this is the famous Bayes formula. And why it became famous and why did it, people why did it generate so much controversy? Because of the interpretation. Otherwise, mathematics, there is nothing controversial about the mathematics. It's uh, straightforward. But the interpretation is very difficult because now the way that you can interpret it, and this is, this, this is why subjective probability is involved here, that suppose that I don't know which world I am living in. I don't know whether Napoleon won or, uh, what, uh, or uh, Wellington won. And now I want to find out. So I look at a person and I say that, okay, I, I know all of these parameters and probabilities. So I say, okay, if a person is speaking French, if, I, if a randomly chosen person uh, is speaking French, then the chances are 57% that Napoleon would have won. And if the, so this is only a question of my knowledge. It is not a question about the real world because the real world, one of the two things has already happened. So that's why the Bayesian calculation makes sense only in the subjective context. It doesn't make sense in the objective context because in objective context, uh, there's no probability anymore. So we are calculating a probability for something which, for which there is no probability anymore. And this is uh, the case for all Bayesian calculations. They always do something like that. And so therefore, it's always about my knowledge about something rather than the reality of something. All right, that's the end of part one of this lecture. Uh, now we are going to explore uh, some technical details. I'm going to try to explain uh, the concept of probability and uh, uh, statistical inference in the simplest possible real world example. And first I will do the theory of conventional standard uh, statistical inference, which you are all supposed to know, but most likely you don't because uh, the way you are taught, uh, this, these materials are not covered. So uh, you start all, uh, at the top of the skyscraper and nobody ever teaches you the ABC, which is the uh, requirement uh, for, and then you never learn. So start with the regression model. So we are going to start with very, very simple concepts and uh, so, first of all, a parameter is a fixed quantity which is unknown to the statistician. For example, in the just uh, case we were just discussing, whether or not uh, Napoleon won, this would be a parameter because it's something which has already happened, it's fixed, but it is not known to the statistician. Then he will try to find out by taking a random sample. So. Uh, so there is this unknown parameter, then we do some random sampling, like we pick a person at random and ask him, do you speak French? So from this uh, sampling, we find out some information that is relevant to the parameter, and then the issue is that from this information, I have to make some uh, statement, which is called inference, about what is the possible values of the parameter. So that's the basic job of uh, the statistician, whether it's Bayesian or whether it's uh, conventional, this job is the same, but the methods for doing this are different. So for the moment, first I will cover the standard conventional methodology for 
statistical inference. So I'm going, but I'm going to do this in a real world example. This is a real world example in 1936 elections in the USA. Uh, this was the uh, world war was going on and Great Depression had already taken place in 1929. So there was the Democratic candidate who was Roosevelt and there was the Republican candidate who was Landon and uh, there was a great deal of uh, discussion as to who is going to win. So there was this um, magazine called Literary Digest which was very popular and very famous and they had been calling the election results for the last several elections and they had said that they had predicted the who was going to win. <coughs> so they had a huge readership. So they sent out uh, letters to all of their readers telling, asking them, who will you vote for in this election? So they got about two and a half million responses, which is a huge sample size. Uh, and uh, their uh, prediction was that so, uh, in the pre-election survey, the Literary Digest uh, had 2.4 million people who were polled and 43% of them were voting for Roosevelt and 57% were voting for Landon, which is a huge margin. Yani, uh, we have about 14% difference between the two. So, Literary Digest very confidently predict that Roosevelt would lose and Landon would win. Now. Gallup was just starting up a new polling company. Now he's very famous. At that time, he was unknown. And he had learned about these new methods for uh, sampling. And he used these to do two things. First of all, uh, the um, Literary Digest poll was going on. And long before the poll was finished, he said he predicted that the Literary Digest is going to say that uh, Roosevelt will get uh, 44 percent of the vote. Uh, so he predicted what the Literary Digest would say, not uh, the poll, and, and the difference was only 1 percent. The Literary Digest came out uh, with 43 percent, but instead of 2.5 million, Gallup, I have on this slide it says 300, but actually it was 3,000. So he used a sample of only 3,000, and he predicted the outcome of the Literary Digest poll with 1 percent accuracy. So uh, this shows if it is a reliable method that they didn't have to go and ask two and a half million people. They could have done it with 3,000 only. Uh, then he also predicted the actual result of the election. He said that they are, they are going to be wrong. This is what they are going to predict, but they are going to be wrong. The actual result is going to be 56 percent votes for Roosevelt. Now. Uh, he was right and the, the, the, the actual result was 62 percent votes were received by Roosevelt. So the uh, Gallup poll was quite bad for the actual election. It was not, it, it was only within, I mean, 8 per percentage points. It was very bad, but still he got the right answer, so that makes it good. And um, he used a sample of 50,000, which is pretty large but much, much smaller uh, by a factor of 100, uh, not 100, but 50, than, uh, than the um, Literary Digest sample. So with a much smaller sample, he got a much more accurate result. So that is the question. How did this happen? This is the, so the question we want to discuss now is, why did uh, Literary Digest make such a huge error with such a large sample? And how did Gallup get good results with such a small sample? This is the main main issue that we want to discuss. So basically, <clears throat> the thing that people didn't understand then and people don't understand now is the difference between a haphazard sample and a random sample. <coughs> See, this is due to a problem with the um, English language. Yes, in the English language, we have the word random just means without any system. If I just... Uh, uh, point to somebody at random, this is a random choice. According to English, is perfectly valid. Now, the statisticians use random in a very technical sense. They say that I make a random choice from these students 
if every student has exactly equal chance of being in that sample. So, if you want to say that this is a random sample, then you have to prove that everybody had an equal chance of being, uh, being selected. In a haphazard sample, we don't know the probabilities and we cannot calculate them. For example, if I sit down here in the morning and before the class starts, and uh, then I say, okay, I'm going to choose the first person who walks in. It's pretty random. I don't know who is going to be. Nobody can tell who it's going to be. But it is not, uh, so according to English language, it is random. But according to probability theory, it is not random because I cannot tell what is the probability of for every person and I cannot tell if all the probabilities are equal. So this is very important. Usually people are doing samples of convenience, whatever, uh, whoever they can catch and then they are treating it as a random sample and this is a big mistake because uh, you can see the how big the mistake is by comparing the literary digest uh, and the Gallup. Literary Digest had a huge sample, but it was a sample of convenience, their own readers, whom they had addresses for, and they could write to, and they get back. So even in the huge sample of convenience, you have no guarantee of accuracy. With a very small random sample, you have a very good guarantee of accuracy. This fact is not understood by most people. All right, so now I'm going to do some calculations for a very small random sample. Suppose that in the same election, so we have these 40 million people, we know that, um, okay, so the true results are known that 62% people, there were 40 million total voters, 24.8 million or 62% voted for Roosevelt, 38% or 15.2 million voted for Landon. Now, um, what we are going to do now, the thing is that this, uh, let's treat the 62% as a parameter. You can make anything you like, unknown parameter. So we could make it, uh, for example, the number 24.8 million. These are all parameters, but we focus on one parameter. Usually, there is one parameter of interest. And then there are some nuisance parameters which are not of interest, but they are still uh, important in the sense that uh, if there are many things unknown and they make a difference, then you have to somehow deal with them. But now we have a very simple situation. We can, any one of the four numbers, they are all the same. If we make 62% our parameter, then we can calculate that it's 24.8 million. And we can calculate the 38%, which is 1 minus that. And we can calculate the 15.2 million. So everything is clear. So any one of the numbers will be okay as a parameter. So let's target uh, the, the focus on the 62%. So that's going to be our parameter. Now the thing is that the parameter is, is known after the elections, but now we are uh, pre-experimental situation. We don't know what's going to happen. So now we are conducting the poll, uh, but uh, to find out what will happen. So what we do is we take a random sample of 50 people only, but it has to be a random sample, a perfect random sample in the sense that every person has an exactly uh, equal chance of being chosen. Now, uh, let's look at B1. This is our Bernoulli trial. So we um, pick a random per person out of these 40 million people and then we ask, are you going to vote for Landon or are you going to vote for Roosevelt? So if you vote for Roosevelt, then we count it as a success and we uh, write 1 and if he is voting for Landon, we count it as 0. So because we want to calculate the Roosevelt uh, votes. So then the probability, what is the success probability of B1? It's 62% because that's the number of people in the uh, true target population who are voting for Roosevelt and 38% are waiting for London. So if I pick a person at random, everyone has equal chance, then there will be a 62% chance of choosing somebody who's voting for Roosevelt and 58% uh, uh, Oops, no, 38, uh, 40, 38%, 38% chance of London. But it's very simple. Probability is nothing more than percentages. It's made by, much more complicated by these Kolmogorov axioms and mappings and measurabilities. And there's a reason for that, but um, it's nothing more than percentage. You have a population, some people are um, some, there are some females, there are some males. If I pick a person, student at random, what is the probability that the student picked will be a female? 
I just count the number of females and take the proportion. This is, this is all that there is to probability and there is nothing more. Probability is not more complicated than this. This is all there is to probability. Every probability is calculated like this. So, now we, we take a random sample of 50. Every single person has, uh, every single trial has the same 62% chance of success. Uh, then we take the sum of all the successes. So that's the total number in my sample of 50, how many people are voting for Roosevelt. So that number is called the uh, sum of these trials. It will be some number from 0 to 50. And this number has a binomial distribution. And the count of the binomial, the total number of trials is 50. And the success probability on each trial is 62%. Right? This is something that should be well known. Uh, if it is not well known, I have two lectures or more on binomial Bernoulli because this is the most uh, important fundamental brick on which all of probability is constructed. And so it's worthwhile investing some time and effort to learn the binomial model. But uh, I won't spend time developing it, but those who have, are not entirely comfortable with this should go and watch my lectures on the binomial. Uh, there are two lectures on this in the intro stats course and uh, uh, so if you watch those you will get the full detailed derivation of this. So now the thing is that, okay so now we have our sample and now we are going to try to find out what is the problem, what is the parameter. So the parameter Basically, the principle that is used all over the place in statistics is that the sample is similar to the true population. So, uh, the proportion of Roosevelt voters in the sample should be similar to the proportion of voters for Landon in the true population, which is 62%, which is the parameter. So, we just look at the proportion of uh, Roosevelt votes in our sample as the estimate for the parameter which is the proportion in the true population. So now what we can say is okay uh, in my sample I have 50 so let us make the following decision rule if there are 26 people in my sample who are voting for Roosevelt then I will predict a victory for Roosevelt. If there are 27, if there are 28, so whenever I have a clear majority in my sample, I will predict a victory for Roosevelt. If I have 25 or less, I will predict Landon. This is sort of biased because at equals I could do either way, but let's just, you know, it doesn't really matter for the, my purposes. So I'm going to forecast Roosevelt victory if I have 26 or more voters for Roosevelt, and I'm going to forecast Landon victory if I have 25 or less. So now what is the probability that my sample will give be misleading? I, what is the probability that I will make a wrong forecast? All right, so that's very easy to calculate. Uh, the Excel has a built-in function for the binomial distribution and it gives the cumulative probabilities. So uh, binom dist is my distribution function I put in the k which I want to calculate for uh, uh, and then I put in the number of trials, the probability of success for each trial and uh, the last argument says true or false, whether I want the probability for that single k or the cumulative probability for all numbers up to that k. So the probability that s is less than or equal to 25 is binom dist of 25, I put the k, but the k should be replaced by 25, 50, 62 percent and true. And this comes out to only 5 percent. It's amazing. Yani, let's have a, let me show you the probability. Uh, where is my Excel? Uh, this is amazing because in a sample of size 50, I have a 95% probability of making the right prediction. Why do I want to have 3,000 samples? And if I can get such accuracy with, with just a sample of size 50, and 
is it really it seems un, uh, and uh, one thing to note is that the 40 million didn't enter there's no 40 million in uh, anywhere in the calculation so let's look at this equals by norm dist off oh, let me do it like this Now I can put in this comma fifty comma zero point six two comma two. So this is zero point zero five six five point six percent probability that the number will be uh, like this. I would like you to show you the probabilities just because it is important to have an idea, intuitive idea of the size of these probabilities. Because if you are, you, sh you should be able to have, I mean, you should be able to guess that this will be around 5%. If you have the right, uh, uh, yani, uh, this is something training that you need as a statistician. You should know binomial probabilities by sort of by feel without having to do the calculation. So I'm just going to uh, show you what these probabilities are. Now I'm going to put in false so we can look at the probabilities. So this is uh, really a hugely small number e to the minus 22. Mm. How do I do this? So probabilities are going to be very zero like over there. So we don't need it. All right. So here are the probabilities for the binomial probabilities. You see that the, you see basically the intuition that you need to learn is that 62% is your uh, success probability. So basically you expect to see probabilities near 62%. And as you go far away from 62% in the sample, the probabilities will be low. So this is what it means to say that the sample reflects the true population. The true population, the parameter has 62%. So the sample will not deviate very much from that. How much? Well, basically it can't get to 18. Yani 18 out of 50, that's 36%, is too far from 62 this is this is the intuition it's a, you can't get that in, in a sample size 50 50 is fairly large sample as things go uh, okay so at 30 now we are getting 10 percent probability so now 30 to 62 this is pretty a large what this is the cumulative is it yes sir. yes yes right but i thought oh False, isn't it? Yes, false. So false me cumulative ni ani chahiye. Magar ye cumulative aari. Nahi, it's not. It's not cumulative. Okay, okay. It's just rising, but it's not cumulative. Okay, I got it. So at thirty, so oh, I see. Oh, yes, yes. I'm um, getting mixed up because uh, this is fifty, not hundred. This is not twenty-seven percent. At 25, we have 50% probability, and that's, uh, so at 24, we have 48% probability. So at around 48%, we are starting to see some real probability, 1.5%, and then 50% uh, is 2.5%. And this 30 is big because it's 60%. It's very close to the truth. 11, so 11.5. Um, this is the biggest number, 31. 
exactly corresponds to 62% probability. Mm -hmm. And so this is the biggest probability. Uh, there's one uh, very important phenomena that I mentioned in the lectures in the, that I have mentioned that, okay, so this is exact 62% probability. It is pretty big, 11%. Now, if we go to 100, okay, I'll ask you to guess and ask what is the probability of 62? And in the same problem, we have, but instead of sample size 50, we take sample size 100. And now 62 is an exact match for the true probability. So what is the what will the probability? Will it be bigger than 11.5 percent, or will it be less than 11.5 percent? This is uh, wrong. It's actually less, and not only really less, but as you increase the sample size, it will go to zero. This is the so the probability of an exact match goes to zero, but probability of near match goes to one. So this is there's a, there's a contradiction between these two, and that's why students get confused about this. The law of large numbers says that the approximately the ratio of the uh, sample probability will converge to the true probability. But if you th say exactly, then it doesn't happen. But if you say approximately, it does happen. So you have to understand these subtle differences. Okay, so, so basically, as you can see, uh, we are looking at the probabilities above 25. And so you see 25 and below, the, all the numbers are very low. So the chances of a misleading sample is very small, right? So that's what I wanted to show that in the case of the... So again, as I said, this is a very puzzling result. How come we can get such accuracy with such a small sample? Okay, so basically the issue is that the accuracy of the sample depends on the accuracy of the randomization. How can we ensure that the... Um, Randomization is good in the sense that every person gets an equal chance to be chosen. Uh, this, uh, uh, the comparison is made to a well-mixed liquid. If you have a liquid solution of lots of different things, but all are liquid, and you mix it up very well, then any drop will be exactly like any other drop. So if you take a very small sample, you will be able to tell everything in that mixture. But if the sample is not mixed very well, then it will not be representative and some places you will have some things and in other places you will have other things. So this is the importance of randomization. If you can... Um, and uh, one of the, the things that it explains, a very uh, counterintuitive property, is that the accuracy of the sample depends only on the sample size, not on the population. This is something which is not understood. I was at the Federal Bureau of Statistics and I gave up trying to explain this because, I mean, they have spent their lifetime in sampling and they said, okay, if we have a big population, then you need a bigger sample. This makes intuitive sense. But actually, the accuracy of the sample has nothing to do with the size of the population. It has everything to do with how well you randomize. Now, um, basically, the, the gold standard, which is the simple random sample, is almost impossible to create. Because what do we need to do? Suppose I want to create a random sample from uh, Pakistan. Then what I need to do first is to have a list of all of the people in Pakistan in order to be able to make sure that everybody gets a chance. Uh, but there is no such list, and nor can I make one up. And if I made one up, it would be changing <laughs> constantly as people die and people are born. So, in the first place, the simple random sample is impossible. Now, what happened in the um, Gallup poll, the Literary Digest uh, database was very easy target because they had a list of all of the names of the subscribers with the ad addresses. So you can easily pick a random sample out of that, and that's what he did, and that's why he got a very accurate result, because if you can pick a random sample, you will get a very accurate result, because the base is there. But if you do the whole population, then you are in trouble, because you how do you pick a random sample from the whole population of the USA? It's almost impossible to do. So... Uh, 
what we do, we, we carry out surveys all the time and we try to do them properly. So the first thing to do is to have a frame, what the uh, frame for sampling. So what the statistical, the Federal Bureau of Statistics does, it has divided Pakistan into a lot of little square areas. So now um, each area has anywhere between 1,000 to 1,500 people in it. Now, so within those little frames, so we have Pakistan is divided into all of these little uh, patches. They have a name which I've forgotten. Yes. Huh? Yes. There's a small area. It's, it's a technical name for uh, which is huh? uh, Moza district, something Tehsil, things like that. So I think it's even they go below the Moza level to to Union Council. Yes, Union Council can be one of the frames, but sometimes if the Union Council is too big, then they go even further. Huh? Yes, I think it's they have their own special. Thing. But anyway, so uh, 1,000 to 1,500, and so then you have, uh, I think, so you have something like 150,000 of these all over Pakistan, or more than that. Then um, we pick from this, so now we have a list of frames, and we pick from this list some random units. Now we are not picking... Now, different frames have different amounts of people in them, so we're not going to give an equal probability, and we're not going to get a simple random sample. And as I said, simple random sample is not possible, and it's not necessary. <coughs> what we need is actually what is called a probability sample. <coughs> in a probability sample, the, uh, the thing is that you can calculate the probability for each person of being picked. You don't, you don't have the same probabilities, but you can calculate this. So, basically, the, um, so within uh, one of the framing units, within one of these mozes, for example, we have 1,500 people or so. And then again, we, we, we repeat this, because actually we don't even know, and we can't even count the exact number of people within a given uh, framing unit. But so what you do is you count the number of house houses. So let's think about that problem. That's relatively easy. So suppose we take uh, the sector F8, and now this is fairly clearly mapped out into houses. We ignore all of the bastis and kachiyabadis and homeless people. And we just say, OK, we're going to sample from the people who are, the population is the people who are living in the houses. Still, we have a problem. We can't go to every house and count the number of people in all the houses. But we can count the number of houses. Let's say that this is a 10 by 10 grid. There are 100 houses. So now we pick at random some houses from this. And then we go and count how many people there are in each house. So from this random sample, we can get an estimate or a distribution of household size. So we can now fill in the blanks that, okay, our random sample, uh, there's one house with one person, two houses with two people, five houses with three people, 20 houses with uh, four people, uh, 15 houses with three people, uh, with, with five people, and so on. So we get a distribution, and we say, okay, this is the true distribution. That allows us to tell about the total population, a guess at the total population. It's not the true total population because now we extrapolate from sample to population. And then from within the houses, we can pick a random sample. And uh, so suppose we pick one person from each house, then it will be true that people who are living in big households will have a small chance of being chosen, even if the household is chosen. And the people who are living in small houses will have a high chance of being so chosen, but we can calculate these probabilities for every person. And so on this basis, we can do the very complicated calculations that are required for a real-world census. 
All right, so that is the um, end of this lecture. Uh, what I would like you to do is to study the chapter in uh, Friedman and Pisani and Purvis on the census. And actually, I've, I have written up some details in uh, the writing for this. So in the text, there is some more details in, about the Gallup poll and about the Bernoulli. And uh, the Introstats course, which you are all supposed to have done, or at least the material in that Introstats course is supposed to be something that is required as a background for the course. So lectures 12 and 13 of that, which are now available on YouTube, are uh, covering the binomial distribution in great detail. Uh, so that's what I will, and, and the um, chapter in Friedman, Pisani and Purvis uh, statistics textbook, uh, it's on census, I think it's chapter 27. It discusses in detail all of the literary digest poll and the Gallup poll and uh, and the complete discussion. So these are the things that I would like you to do for the next time. And uh, next time we will discuss more uh, about these Bernoulli binomial trials. No accuracy, zero. It's just fraud. <laughs> really, this is fraud. I mean, uh, but because when you choose us, uh, when you choose any kind of a non-random sample. You can do fraud and uh, by choosing the people that will be favoring and it is done all the time. The toothpaste companies advertise that 9 out of 10 dentists surveyed recommend our toothpaste. Now who did they survey? We chose the 10 people who we are paying salaries to. So <laughs> obviously 9 out of 10 of them voted for us. Uh, they didn't say anything about how the survey was random. So as long as the survey is not random, you can get any result you like. Your data, PPHS, oh, when the um, uh, our Federal Bureau of Statistics does sampling, they do their best to try to create a random sam a probability sample, not a simple random sample, and so they they have some controls, and uh, th those are much more reliable.